Good morning, all you magnificent melon heads of the world. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Today is April 16th, 2024. And the top story this morning is the bank's profits are getting crushed. Banks are in bad shape here. Higher interest rates typically means good things for banks. And that's a big problem. Because the banks should be killing it right now. They should be making money hand over fist. Because when interest rates go up, Banks make loans. Interest rates is the price of loans. You know, companies usually do better when the price of their product goes up. I mean, we're, we're talking real high level here, but this holds up. This is how it's supposed to be. Unless you're a bank operating in this scenario with this Federal Reserve and this United States Treasury Department. You see, what's going on right now is the Fed is holding interest rates right here, where they're at, you know, five, five and a quarter percent. The Fed has raised short term interest rates and the U.S. Treasury is issuing more short term interest rates, preventing in, instead of issuing more long term debt, they're issuing T-bills, shorter duration debt. Well, that is causing the banks to have their profitability squeezed because banks borrow short term and banks lend long term. Well, because the Fed is holding rates where they're at and because the Treasury is issuing all on the short end of the yield curve, the short-term interest rates that the bank's paying are rising. The long-term interest rates, well, they're also rising, but not as much. They're still lower. This inverted yield curve is killing our bank's profitability. You don't hear a lot about that. You hear about the soft landing all the time. You hear strong and resilient and well-capitalized. Oh, our banks are doing very well. You know, oh, Yeah, Janet, thanks. The banks are great. And how come we're getting numbers like this, like Bank of America's profit down 18% year over year? Say what? That just came out today. 18% decline in profit at Bank of America. Any other industry, if a company reports an 18% decline in profit, their stock gets destroyed. PNC Financial, they're also reporting today. That's the sixth biggest bank in the country, I believe. 21% decline in profitability. We saw the same thing at J.P. Morgan last week. We saw the same thing at a couple other big banks on Friday. Oh, and by the way, while this is going on, while these profits are getting clobbered, there's some interesting things happening. The banks are actually setting aside less money for credit loss provisions. Come again? And uh, I, I got to send a shout out to meet Kevin here. He called him out on it yesterday. And uh, you know, guys, nobody special. I'm not the president of the Meet Kevin fan club here by any measure. But he is right on the money here. Me, Kevin, put out a video yesterday. Uh, what was the title of it? I actually got it here on my phone here. I was watching it this morning. Shout out to my moderator, Mish. Um, SH star T. Uh, this is really bad. Economic collapse is happening. Right? An unusual spat of doomerism from Mr. Me, Kevin. And, you know, look, Me, Kevin is usually like, yay, NVIDIA. And number go up and soft landing. You know, he, he he's kind of a... Not trying to knock him here, but I guess I kind of no no way to sugarcoat it. He's he's historically been a little bit of a cheerleader, where I have historically been a bit of a doomer, right? Right there on the arm, perma bear. But you know, mark the date and time. Jack and Kevin are on the same page this morning. Something's up at the banks. Me, Kevin's going out and he's saying they are outright lying. They are faking their earnings. They're reducing their credit loss provisions in order to inflate their profitability to make it look better. Because typically when you set aside money for credit losses, because, oh, I don't know, people ain't paying their bills. Well, typically that usually comes out of the bank's earnings. They set that money aside. It's a big negative on their quarterly results. Well, the banks are reducing their credit loss provisions while at the same time, net charge-offs, which is loans that actually have gone bad, they're on the rise. In other words, yeah, the banks are lying about how much money they're making. Whoa, I'm sure that's going to end well. I mean, yeah, when, when J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and PNC Financial all get together and decide to lie about their earnings, I'm sure that usually means good things are coming for you and I, right? Uh, maybe not. Might, might want to pay attention to that one. Uh, Bank of America and PNC both doing terrible. Well, both their profits doing terrible. The stock's not so terrible, but the profits are just getting absolutely crushed. We also got earnings from Johnson & Johnson this morning. They were pretty good. Sales up 2.3%. Uh, a lot of those elective procedures that are going on in the medical industry, people put off getting that job done that they wanted to have done, whatever elective procedure. They didn't want to go near the hospital during the vid. Now they're getting that done. A lot of these elective procedures are crowding out hospitals now. So 
the, the hospitals are working through these backlogs of elective procedures. That's very good for J&J's earnings because they sell a lot of medical supplies. Um, Johnson & Johnson also increased their dividend today. That is 62 consecutive years of dividend increases for J&J, who is like the OG of the dividend aristocrats. Also, United Health reported today we got our first peek at the the financial impact of the Change Healthcare Hack, one of the biggest data breaches in the healthcare industry's history. Looks like $872 million is the cost in this quarter, and they're expecting up to $1.6 billion in total costs. And the market let out a big sigh of relief on that because United Health stock is rocketing this morning on that news. I guess there was a little bit more pessimism built into the share price. And so when we got those numbers, they really liked it. A lot of people buying UNH stock. It's causing this outsized move in the Dow this morning because UNH is a big Dow component. So the Dow's doing a little better than the other indexes. Uh, speaking of higher rates causing problems here, building permits in the U.S. down 4.3% month over month. Wait, building permits are supposed to go up in the spring. We build more houses in the spring, don't we? Not when interest rates are rising like they did last week. Oh, also housing starts. Even worse, down 14.7%. That number just came out this morning. The housing market is feeling the pinch of those higher interest rates that we got last week. On the back of that big inflation scare, it's affecting mortgage rates, and it's affecting the construction industry. Uh, reverse repo, big drawdown in reverse repo yesterday, $80 billion. Only 300 and I believe $327 billion in excess liquidity remaining in the financial system. And when that number gets to zero, zero, I'm sure everything's going to be just fine. It's going to be great. Big downgrades in China. Fitch is downgrading Chinese state-owned banks and government-sponsored enterprises. UK unemployment shot up this morning. Macro Edge says job cuts in the U.S. are on pace for their biggest number in over a year. Over 60,000 job cuts announced in the U.S. And Macro Edge has been right on the money with their analysis lately. There's a lot happening in the world today. Jack needs to take a second to breathe, and we need to shrink my big melon of a head and take a look at what is happening in these markets today because there's there's a lot to cover today, guys. So while we're here, don't forget that like button. Hit that for the YouTube algorithm. really helps out this channel. And if you're new here, right next to that like button is that subscribe button and that notification bell. Hit those too, and then come back tomorrow and have your coffee with the melon heads because we do this every day. The S&P 500 is up 10 points or 0.2% this morning, recovering a little bit of what it lost yesterday. Emphasis a little bit. Uh, check this one out, guys. Technical event yesterday. This is the S&P 500. These are daily candles going back to about October of last year. And wouldn't you know it, the S&P lost its 50-day moving average yesterday. There it is shown in blue. And then this light red line here, that's the 200-day moving average. And then this horizontal line, that is the high from November of 2021, which we blew through back in January. Uh, so big technical event in the S&P. We're up a little bit today. We'll see if that level holds. The last time we crossed the 50-day moving average was back at the end of October, beginning of November, which is what started this ridiculous bull run. So we'll see. The tide seems to be going out in stocks now. The Dow is up this morning, however, 232 points or 0.62% higher uh, the Dow's making an outsized move again because of that big move in United Health stock. UNH is having – it's a major Dow component. So the Dow's faring better than the S&P or the NASDAQ this morning. And the NASDAQ is also positive by 13 points, just barely, 0.08% higher for the NASDAQ. Uh, that is after yesterday's bloodletting that we had in tech stocks. The NASDAQ was down over a percent and a half yesterday. And right back on that long-term chart, this is going back to about the start of this year. Again, daily candles. And check it out. We lost the 50-day moving average in the NASDAQ also. And, uh, well, here, let's zoom in a little bit. Again, the last time we crossed the 50-day moving average was at the beginning of November and the start of this monster bull run. Well, it looks like that may be over. Look for a back test of that 50-day moving average. And if it holds and we head lower, well, the 200 is uh, way, way lower from here. The U.S. dollar is taking a breather this morning at 106.2. That's after strengthening yesterday on the heels of that Higher than expected retail sales report. The market realized a little late in the day yesterday that, oh, those retail sales numbers, they looked really good, but that also means inflation. That also means a more aggressive Federal Reserve, and the dollar started to strengthen after that. Also, a little bit of the uh, back and forth between Israel and Iran. It looks like Israel is going to respond to the Iranian attack and this ridiculously scripted theater 
I'm hearing the phrase kinetic diplomacy thrown around a lot on the military channels out there, like uh, Sandbox News is a pretty good one that I follow. Uh, kinetic diplomacy means these guys are firing missiles just so the cameras can cover them exploding and say they did a thing, they shot a thing, yay me, I'm so tough. These arrogant a-holes playing with people's lives like pawns on a chessboard, some things never change, what can I say? Uh, meanwhile, we've got the yield curve this morning, higher across the board, interest rates still grinding higher. The 30-year treasury, 4768 up almost three points this morning. The 10-year, 4.662, up another three and a half points. The 10 just keeps on rising. The two, 4.953, that's up a point and a half. And the one month at 5.392, up one point this morning. Uh, check this one out, big one from yesterday. This is this is important. The re overnight reverse repo, it shrank by $80 billion yesterday. Now, the reverse repo, it started falling all last year. Uh, it was on pace to be empty by now. We were covering this a lot late last year. And then at the start of this year, it leveled off and it stopped declining almost outright in March. Well, now it's dropping again. I don't know what caused that $80 billion drop yesterday. Somebody needed liquidity, a lot of it, over the last few days. I don't know who it was. If you guys have an idea about what was behind this $80 billion drop in reverse repo yesterday, let me know down in the comments. I went looking yesterday. Nothing obvious stuck out at me. Uh, but that's important. $327 billion remaining. That's down from about $2.5 trillion at its peak. So the market is on its way towards a shortage of liquidity. Not there yet. Still plenty of time, though. Uh, although if this keeps up at $80 billion, I mean, there's four days left in the reverse repo at that rate. I don't expect we're going to keep dropping $80 billion a day, though. Let's look over at the commodities board this morning. We've got June gold futures are higher by about $5.30 at $2,388 or about 0.22% higher. Uh, spot gold is actually down a little bit here. Silver is down this morning. We got May silver futures at $28.39. That's down 30 cents or about 1% lower. Spot is also down. Uh, let's see. Platinum is about flat. Palladium is down 2.3%. May WTI crude oil futures at 85.09. That's down about 32 cents or about 0.4% lower. Now let's talk a little bit about metals and this big run in gold. It seems to have run out of steam a little bit this week, but you know what? I'm not convinced this move in metals is over. First of all, let's take a look at this one. This is the silver chart. We're looking at daily candles going back to about August of last year. And this red line, this red line is right around $28.30. And this is important because this was the level that was really the battleground during the silver squeeze and the year, year and a half after the silver squeeze. This was the level that historically Mr. Slammy stepped in and defended. And he did just that last week. As soon as we broke above that level, here he was on Friday. He came in and he slammed us back down. Now, yesterday we broke above that level. And, well, today we are once again, fighting for that level, the price is down this morning, 28.35 in silver. I mean, we're right around that 28.30 level, All right? I want to see a move above this level. We're retesting it right now. We break above this level, guys. The sky is the limit. I mean, 30 is a little bit of a psychological barrier. But in my opinion, this is the important technical level. Above this, I think we're heading to new highs. And new highs, we're talking mid-40s, guys. I mean, there's a lot of room to the upside in silver here. Now, let's talk about some of the reasons why I think metal still has a lot of room to run here. Take a look at this one. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, data from the U.S. Mint. U.S. investors shy away from buying gold. This is the number of ounces of gold in American gold eagles sold by the U.S. Mint for the month of March. All right, So they take the, mo the March sales of gold, US, U.S. gold eagles, and they compare how much they sold in March every year going back to 2019. And I mean, obviously, in 2020, with all the money printing and the scare, gold eagles exploded higher. They stayed high in 2021. Same thing, 22, 23. Retail was piling in and buying gold eagles. Well, look at 2024. Retail is sitting out this rally in metals. All right, the guy, the, the average buyer, the, the little guy at home, he is not buying this rally in gold. That tells me that there's still a lot of buyers on the sideline that are not participating in this rally, and that tells me that this thing could still go higher. It could still go a lot higher. So what we've got here is retail's not buying. This is the institutional money is buying up gold right now. And worse still, not only is retail sitting it out, but it looks like retail might actually be fighting this rally in gold. 
Check this one out from Bloomberg. This is from uh, two days ago on the 14th. At a Brooklyn pawn shop, customers are flooding in to sell gold. Everyone and their brother is selling grandma's old jewelry right now. Not only is retail not buying gold eagles, retail is pawning their jewelry. Again, this tells me the price could still head higher. And by the way, all you guys out there, all you soft landing, all you gaslighters in the mainstream financial press who are telling us the economy is so good. What's the problem with you with your bad economic vibes? Stay off of social media. That's why you think the economy is bad. Just just believe what we tell you that the economy is so good. Okay, then explain to me why everybody is selling their jewelry. Is that a sign that things are so good? Take a look at this story. Investors and metal traders can't agree on what exactly is behind gold's recent rally, self-included. But at King's Pawn and Gold in Brooklyn, the customers don't care. They just want to sell. People are using gold as an ATM they never had, said Gene Furman, owner of King's Pawn and Gold at and Empire Gold Buyers. At Furman's Fifth Avenue store, the number of people coming in Selling and pawning gold jewelry is more than three times above normal levels since prices started to rally in February. So not only are people, are average retail investors not participating in this rally in gold, they're not buying gold eagles, they're selling their gold jewelry. That means the institutional money is just buying up all the gold on the cheap while the average person sells any gold, any silver he's got just to buy freaking groceries because he can't pay the bills. So Greg Ipp at the Wall Street Journal, who was talking all about how the problem isn't the economy, it's you. All right, fit this into your thesis, Greg. Tell me how this fits with your bad vibes analysis. Why are people selling their gold at three times the rate while the prices were? Why, Greg? Does that mean that times are good? No, times are not good. All right, shifting from that one. Bitcoin down again this morning, 379 lower. This is as priced in Coinbase, $63,077 for Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has had a brutal couple of days here, selling off, still consolidating. And guys, we are just three days and a few hours away from the next halving event. So again, historically, this is right about the time Bitcoin starts resuming higher. Things are a little different this time. Uh Uh-oh, there's Jack with that cliche. We didn't have the ETF approval heading into the halving last three times in a row. So yes, that's a new variable in this equation. But historically, having events have seen big moves in Bitcoin price to the upside, although we're having a little bit of consolidation at the moment. Now, let's talk about this one. This is a big story this morning. This is why I think the Dow is doing so well here. United Health takes an $872 million hit to profits from the Change Healthcare hack. Uh, You know, the Change Healthcare hack, that was a big one, guys. Millions of people had their data stolen. Uh, We didn't really get any information about the financial impact of that. This was the first we've heard. United Health expects to take a hit of as much as $1.6 billion this year from disruptions caused by the February cyber attack at its Change Healthcare unit. Despite the disruptions, United Health still beat estimates for the first quarter adjusted profit, sending its shares higher in pre-market trading. It has already booked $872 million in costs related to the data breach in the quarter, most of it as one-time items. So United Health stock is just ripping this morning, up almost 7% here, trading at $476.50. It appears that the market was expecting much worse than this, and so they're rallying. They're dragging the Dow higher with it. The Dow is outperforming the S&P and the NASDAQ, largely because of United Health this morning. Now let's talk about the bank earnings. This is big here, guys. The bank's profits are getting squeezed, and we see it again from Bank of America here. Bank of America tops estimates on better-than-expected interest income and investment banking. And you just got to love how the titles tell you a story that they want you to hear, and then the data says the exact opposite better than expected interest income explain that to me guys and (laughs) bank of america on tuesday reported first quarter earnings that topped analyst estimates for profit and revenue on better than expected interest income and investment banking even though their profit was down 18 percent year over year the bank said profit fell 18 percent to 6.67 billion dollars or 76 cents a share excluding a 700 million dollar hit to the from the fdic Profit was $0.83 cents a share if you take out that F- FDIC charge. And even revenue was down. Revenue slipped 1.6% to $25.98 billion as net interest income declined from a year early. So how do we get titles that net interest income was better than expected when we've got revenue was down 1.6%, a modest decline, but profit is down 18%. 
Well, when your revenue drops less than 2%, your profit drops 18%, that means your margins are getting destroyed. And yet CNBC tells us, don't worry, that's better than expected interest income. Are you sure about that? Are you sure that's better than expected? Your expectations were pretty low there, CNBC. I'm just saying. Now, I want to send a shout out to Frog Capital on X, who posted this one today. And this is there's a lot of data going on on the screen here, but I want to draw your attention to these charts on the side here. They're consumer charge-offs. That's important data. Look at the charge-offs. This is people who just aren't going to pay the bank back. And the bank is saying, you know what? We're writing this guy off. He ain't paying his bills. Consumer net charge-offs up to $1 billion, $28 million. All right. Most of that is credit card. On commercial side, big increase in their commercial real estate charge-offs. Uh, total commercial net charge-offs, $470 million. So Bank of America's net charge-offs total up to $1.5 billion. That's up 26% year over year. All right, so a lot of people not paying their bills. Also, banks having to pay extra money to keep their depositors because depositors can go to money markets and make more money over there, putting their money in T-bills. And so the banks are having to increase what they're paying out in their deposit accounts well, they're not making that many loans because the housing market's frozen, the auto market's in terrible shape, and then people aren't paying their credit card bills. So the banks aren't making money here. Meanwhile, though, Bank of America stock somehow, maybe because that CNBC headline was so rosy, it's up 1.5% ahead of the opening bell, 56 cents to the upside, trading at 36.51. And we got some similar results from PNC Financial. PNC profits 21%. Amid weaker interest income, well, Reuters at least being a little more upfront and honest with the headline here, yeah, profit fell 21%, not better than expected on better interest income. PNC Financial Services reported a 21% fall in first quarter profit on Tuesday, hurt by lower interest income as the lender paid more to hold customer deposits in a high interest rate environment. There's those T-bills and money markets drawing money out of the banks again, so the banks are having to increase what they pay to keep that money from leaving. The bank also forecasts net interest income will decline about 1% in the current quarter compared to the first quarter. Now, we got something similar. This is Reuters. Check this one out in Newswires. PNC Financial Service, first quarter profit and revenue fall. I want to scroll all the way down here because there's some interesting things here. In this period, PNC said delinquencies fell by about 8% to $1.28 billion, while higher commercial real estate non-performing loans weighed on its total non-performing loans, which rose 9% to $2.38 billion. So with delinquencies, they're, they're down a little bit. I guess that's credit cards. They're not specifying what delinquencies are down here. But their delinquencies shrank a little bit to $1.28 billion. But their non-performing loans and commercial real estate at PNC way up by 9% to $2.38 billion. So total non-performing, total bad debt at this bank is obviously higher here, $2.38 billion in non-performing loans, $1.28 billion in delinquencies. And yet the allowance for credit losses was $5.37 billion versus $5.41 billion a year ago. So PNC lowered their provisions for credit losses by $40 million, even though their non-performing loans are on the rise. That's what Meet Kevin was talking about in that video that he did yesterday. The banks are creating earnings out of thin air by reducing their credit losses. And when you reduce credit losses, that goes right onto your quarterly earnings. And so they're making it look like they're more profitable than they are because, well, their interest income is getting just absolutely demolished because they're having to pay up for deposits. They're not making many loans. The loans they are making, a lot of people aren't paying them back. And at the same time, they're reducing their loss provisions to make themselves look more profitable. And as me, Kevin said, yeah, they're lying, guys. The banks are just lying here. Very dishonest behavior. We saw this last week with JP Morgan. Also, they're doing it down at PNC. And well, PNC stock, it looks like somebody called them out on it because PNC stock is down 2.11% this morning, 146.40. That's down $3.16. We also got earnings from J&J &J here. Uh, not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Tops quarterly profit estimates, medical device sales jump. That's all those elective procedures finally getting done after years of the vid. But the one thing I do want to point out here is, here, where is it? I had it highlighted and I lost it. Here we go. Where's the dividend? Uh, J&J said it will increase its quarterly dividend to $1.24 a share, up from $1.19 a share. 
or or 4.2% higher. This marks the 62nd consecutive year of dividend increases. It said the dividend is payable on June 4th. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, that's one of those companies, guys, where if if you don't want to trade stocks all the time, if you don't want to study charts, and you don't want to move in and out of positions or pay close attention to all the earnings calls and parse words, you know, one of the passive things you can do, and I'm not advocating buying at these levels or anything, but J&J has increased their dividend 62 consecutive years in a row. So parking a couple of bucks in J&J stock and just reinvesting the dividends over 62 years, you would have done pretty well in that environment. So just something to think about. J&J is not an exciting stock, right? It's not going to double in share price in a year because of some stupid AI development or because their CEO wears a black turtleneck or a motorcycle jacket. No, J&J, they just, they just put a couple of pennies in your account at a time in dividends, and then every year they raise it a little bit and they raise it a little more. J&J stock this morning, though, down 1.44%, trading at 145.47, down $2.12. Let's shift gears over to China. Fitch Ratings downgrades the outlook for Chinese state-owned banks. All right, this is a follow-up to last week. Last week, Fitch downgraded China's sovereign credit outlook. Emphasis on outlook, not credit rating. Right, The credit rating is how risky we view the debt. The outlook is the direction we see the rating moving in. So first you downgrade the outlook, then you downgrade the rating if things don't improve. Well, last week they downgraded the credit rating of the not the rating, I'm sorry. Last week, they downgraded the credit outlook for the Chinese government. And well, if you're going to downgrade the outlook for the government, then all of the banks and enterprises that are implicitly guaranteed by that government, they would need to be downgraded too in order to be consistent. And so Fitch is playing catch up here. They're downgrading China's state-owned banks. Uh, What do we have? Six of the banks include Industrial Commercial Bank of China, China Construction Bank, Agriculture Bank of China, Bank of China, Bank of Communications, and Postal Savings Bank of China were all saw their outlook downgraded. I'm sure the Chinese government just loves that. And it wasn't just the banks. You've also got 37 of these centrally owned corporate GREs or government-related enterprises all getting their outlooks dropped to negative. There's a whole big list of here, the Three Gorges Dam, nuclear power plants, railway companies, laundry list of companies that are all implicitly guaranteed by the Chinese government. And well, if you're downgrading the outlook for the government, then you have to downgrade everybody that is supported by the implicit guarantee of said government. So Fitch is downgrading all of them this morning. And why are they doing that? Maybe it's got something to do with the little housing collapse situation they still got going on over there. China's new home prices decline at the fastest pace since 2015. If you follow China, you know 2015 was a pretty rough year over there. New home prices in China fell at their fastest pace in more than eight years in March as the debt woes of major property developers continue to drag on demand in the economic outlook. China's property sector, accounting for nearly a quarter of the economy, has been engulfed by a debt crisis since 2021 after a regulatory crackdown on high leverage among developers triggered a liquidity crunch with a string of them reporting weaker financial results for 2023 last month. That's mildly put. Some of them reported the largest accounting fraud in history. Uh, Evergrande, uh, Country Garden, yeah, pay attention to those. New home prices in March dropped 2.2% from a year earlier, marking the biggest decline since August of 2015 and worse than the 1.4% fall in February, according to Reuters calculations based on the National Bureau of Statistics data. So a lot to unpack in that one comment there. Uh, First of all, Chinese government data, if they're willing to admit a 2.2% decline in prices, it's a good bet that the actual decline is a whole hell of a lot worse. And the biggest decline since August of 2015, August of 2015, that's right after the Chinese stock market bubble popped. So this is the worst things have been in China since 2015. And if you ask me, even worse than 2015, you just can't, you you can't deleverage a multi-decade property bubble that's measured in the tens of trillions of dollars and expect only to see a 2.2% decline in home prices. There is going to be worse data coming out of China still. And speaking of bad real estate data, the U.S. is also getting in on that. It's not just a China thing. Building permits month over month in the United States decreased by 4.3% in March. That's after a 2.3% increase in February. Uh, Building permits being hurt by those higher interest rates. We saw a big move higher in the 10-year interest rate last week. Same same move in the 30-year mortgage. Interest rates going higher makes it harder to build a house, more expensive to build a house. People can't afford the payments. 
And so we got a big drop in building permits. And we saw the same thing in housing starts decreased 14.7% in a month. Whoa. And by guys, housing starts, that means the permit is already issued. The financing is already secured. They're just not building the house because people can't afford it. 14.7% in a month, big drop in housing starts, commensurate drop in building permits, higher interest rates continues to hurt the housing market here. And yet home prices just stubbornly high, still rising in some markets. One more I want to talk about is unemployment, guys. Speaking of the housing market, UK sees the biggest jobless rise since the pandemic. Pay attention, all you guys who trade Forex, because this could affect the DXY here. The UK saw the biggest jump in unemployment since the pandemic. That's according to data released Tuesday that reinforces the likelihood that the Bank of England will soon lower rates. The Office of National Statistics said the unemployment rate in the three months that from February rose to 4.2% from 3.9%, so a 0.3% bump in unemployment. Economists had expected the jobless rate to tick up one-tenth of a point to four. Instead, it went to 4.2. All right, so... We're seeing higher unemployment, unemployment rising rapidly in the UK. That means the Bank of England is probably going to cut any day now. And if the Bank of England cuts and the Fed is staying higher for longer, that means a stronger US dollar. That means downward pressure on US asset prices. But it's not like it's just the UK that's seeing the unemployment problem. Shout out to MacroEdge on X who posted this one, job cuts from for April, just the first 16 days of April. And actually, he posted this yesterday. So just the first half of April, the first 15 days, 65,433 job cuts announced in the United States. In the month of March, there was 73,300 for the whole month. We're only halfway through April, and it's already 65,400. There have been a lot of layoffs announced this month. Macro Edge is all over this one. Macro Edge has been very, very accurate lately. And guys, this number was in the 40s just Friday. I covered this chart just on Friday, and it was in the mid-40s. Now here we are on Tuesday, and we're up to 65400 A lot of job cuts being announced here, guys. That strong jobs market, uh, yeah, I'm not strong. I'm not sure you're using that word correctly. I just want to say thank you very much to Mike Kathman, who says, so tired of Metal Smash. No data, no news, just smash. It's orchestrated and illegal, but nobody cares. Mike, I share the frustration. I sat through the silver squeeze. I watched it happen. Uh, but I can tell you, it is a different feeling this time. I, I don't want to sound too cliche. Watch that 2830 level in silver, Mike. They're fighting for it again. We've been at this level before, fought and lost. But that fight is happening again. And right now, retail is sitting this one out. You saw that thing about the gold eagles. You saw that thing about people selling their jewelry. This, the retail is completely sitting out this rally, which means if retail gets in, could drive it even higher. All right, this is the divergence in the economy here. Um, this is a totally different animal than the silver squeeze, in my opinion here. I'm actually more optimistic at this point here. I, I, I want to see this 2830 level in silver hold, though. That's going to be confirmation for me. Uh, but I remain skeptical like a lot of people do. And again, when you see when you see metal bulls holding on to their skepticism, that tells you this is not a FOMO rally. That tells you there's more enthusiasm. There's more buyers on the sideline waiting so this could still go higher, Mike, but I share in your frustration. And thank you, sir, for the super chat and support of the channel. And thank you to Mr. Alex Lieberman for being such an awesome melon head and for supporting the channel as a member. He says, sell gold to buy platinum. Interesting. He likes the platinum move. You know, Mike, or Alex, sorry, I was talking to Mike a second ago. Platinum has, there's two big things in platinum. All right, you got the auto market, which is in really bad shape here. All right, so that's bearish for platinum. But at the same time, the BRICS countries controlling the supply of platinum. You can't ignore that one. Platinum has had a pretty good run here. Um, trading the ratios is is interesting. I, I'm thinking about trading the gold to silver ratio here. But to be honest with you, platinum is just one I don't usually mess with too much. Uh, but it's not a bad idea trading those lever those ratios moving in and out of metals. They're not necessarily taxable events if you can find a dealer that's willing to do that with you. And it's a way to get your total weight up over time. Interesting idea. I, I'm not, I don't follow platinum that closely, Alex, so I can't really comment one way or another on that particular trade. But thank you, sir, for being a Melonhead member. And Nashville Pasta Man, who says just because 100% on gold liquidations by retail, they are broke. 
all buying is institutional. Yes, Pasta Man. And, you know, uh, I had Bob Coleman on my channel over the weekend. We did that interview on on Saturday. Or, no, it was Sunday we did that interview. It was actually, we filmed it Friday. I posted it Sunday. Um, Bob has been telling me for the last couple of months in some of our conversations, a lot of people are using gold and silver as a source of funds. A lot of people who bought in during those high premium times paid those ridiculous premiums for American Silver Eagles. Now they're being forced to sell, not because they want to. It's almost a margin call. They got to pay their bills. They got no money. So they're selling their metals here. So you're right on the money here. This is all institutional. And again, that tells me there is more room to run in this rally because retail is not piled in yet. It's, you know, you're not at the top until retail piles in and retail is not piling in. They're actually still getting out. So thank you very much, Nashville Pasta Man. I appreciate the super chat, sir, the support of the channel. And thank you, Harmon Air LLC. Says, as the great Tim Curry would say, have a lovely, have a lovely day. Oh, that sounded Australian. Crap. Have a lovely day. Was that a little bit better? My, my British and my Australian. I'm sorry, guys. We're all English children, though. Don't, don't hit me too hard. My yelling is better than my British accent. But thank you, Harmon Air LLC. I hope you, too, have a lovely day. And thank you, sir, for supporting the channel. And thank you, everybody, for having your coffee with the Melonheads. Appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you to all my channel members and Patreon supporters. I got the links down below to all that good stuff. Should you guys feel so inclined. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Love you guys. Everybody, till next time, live small and dream big.